what we have been discussing about musicology has an inner connection with subject which we are discussing today history and uh, some of the remarks which we made yesterday about hindustan about musicology about indianness about the near impossibility of being indian in totality all these would apply as they are to this evening's theme too i have here material which is diverse and from diverse sources and perhaps i might make a beginning by saying that uh, as in case of indian musicology i also feel the necessity of changing the direction the content and the presentation of historical presentations on hindustani music obviously many of us are dissatisfied with what we get under the name of history of hindustani music whenever we say hindustani questions like whether you have to start from sama veda should crop up really even though bhatkhande the early trail brazer had already indicated the preference for omitting the hindu period from his discussions and that itself should have served as a pointer to many of us that he with many others believed that hindustani art music as such began its career quite late and basically you are concerned with a period 16th century onwards before that it was india all right but then we really don't know what it was like the musical scene and then if at all you want to approach that period and music in that period perhaps your approaches will have to be different and that's why once again the multiplicity of approaches in historical statements should be the first theme that we should discuss whenever we talk of history historians always of course refer to their own material in different ways and they have their own sciences the shortcomings that come into picture is due to one major fact and that is that when you come to performing arts when you come to music there are problems which are innate with the material itself and that should prompt us to change the methodology the appraisal of the material as well as the presentation formats and this has been ignored and due to various factors we have been overwhelmed by the prestige associated with written material documentation which is of a certain type and our reliance on the written word instead of reliance on the word as such so by and by we'll get deeper into controversies i promise you that but as we go on let us remind ourselves that when you deal with india and with asia you are dealing with a very special kind of cultural formulation theories methods which have been formed outside cannot be applied as they are in case of india and asia in fact people have miserably failed in getting good results from their theoretical applications because they have again equated africa and asia and this again is a kind of sweeping generalization africa is africa india is india asia is asia and we have still to reach quite a number of years ahead before we are able to make universal statements about music just as in case of indian music pan indian approach is very attractive but it's very dangerous you are working with a very slippery material we do not have enough know how do not have enough data on india itself so let us begin in a smaller way rather than coming with universal histories and then floundering when you come to girgam the point involved here is of methodology as well as approach i have turned to history because i am 
pressing problems in my music. I have not turned to history because I am fond of history. What I am suggesting is that performing musicians come across problems which are of a particular nature, but the solution to these problems is quite likely to be in historical appraisal of their material. So that musical history is not something which is only meant for book readers. Musical history is meant for performers, but it has to be, of course, given to us, formulated in a particular manner, and that manner has been overlooked. That's a major statement. How do we come to history of music? You have almost a Russian matushka before you, doll within a doll kind of game. You begin by saying history, then you say cultural history, then you say history of performing arts, then you say history of Hindustani music, and then and there you realize what I have been talking of yesterday, that unless you cover the five categories, you are not even able to talk of Hindustani music. Once again, our elitism has prevented us from looking at history of music. We are missing the wood for the tree. We are concentrating on Raga music and thinking that we are talking of Hindustani music in its historical dimension. It's not true. When we come to music proper, and of course historical statement, two things strike us. All the Western students of Indian culture, or non-Indian students of Indian culture, have repeatedly said that in Asia there is a kind of a historical sense about things in the past. And basically the charge has been that you don't care for chronology, number one. You don't care for periodization, number two. And of course geography also. By and by we'll have to treat these themes at greater details. But at this point let me say that perhaps we have to first look at music as a phenomenon which doesn't take place in time, it manipulates time. When I say it manipulates time, I am suggesting to you that it is not concerned with day-to-day -day time, chronological time. It is dealing with time which is on the contemplative level. When you are talking of time, musical time, rhythm, tala, these are again chains, as you know. The more specific you come to musical experience, the more farther you are from that generalized concept which is identifiable and which can be talked about and which can be written about. But the moment you come to musical experience as such, you'll have to have a different strategy. What I am suggesting is that if Musical time has specific problem because that time is musical. Then perhaps chronology, which is also related with time, will have to be compared in a different manner. I will quote other authorities from other fields to corroborate what I am saying, but let me proceed a little further. The conceptual chain which operates as far as time is concerned in music suggest to you that musical time is in a way entirely artificial. When I say artificial, I am using the term in right royal Sanskrit sense that anything which is man-made, man-created is artificial. Kritrima really means that you create it. It's not there. You have created it. Musical time is created by musicians. Musical time does not exist. Time exists perhaps, even as you know, time does not exist for many. People have been pointing out that. You don't have a separate sense organ to sense time. You have to do something else for that. It's on the conceptual level, it's on the contemplative level. But besides that, musical time as such, well, it boils down to this, that musical time is a result of your contemplative attitude. You create it. 
It's that's why it is Kritrima. The moment you say that, the periodization problem and chronology problem assumes another dimension. As I said, we will come back to that again, but I would like you to remember this Indian way of looking at musical time. Then let us move ahead. As far as history is concerned, there are various definitions, of course. We need not get caught up in that. But somehow history believes that time progresses from A to B to C to D to E, etc. So there is a unilinearity about it. There are others who have said that no, time is circular. It does not go from A to B, but from A to A, A to A1, A to AB, whatever. It is circular. In fact, there are others like a rebel philosopher as Bertrand Russell, for example, he says the universe is all spots and jumps. He doesn't believe in this kind of unilinearity. I am stressing the point because the moment you accept this, a very major plank of historians, that is chronology, loses the importance that it has acquired today. Perhaps historical statement need not be confined to arrangement which is linear on the basis of chronology. And then perhaps, you know, you have to look somewhere. Again, I will come back to this theme later. But this is again related to one more argument. When you are talking of time, chronology, in a unilinear fashion, you are also able to talk of progress. You will say that in the earlier days, there were only five nodes, now there are seven, so we have progressed. Or you may say that there were twelve and we have reduced, and that means we are more economical, that's why we have progressed. Whatever. But this is possible only if you believe in unilinearity of time. The moment this plank is removed under your feet, you are not able to make this statement of progress. And then you will have to have something else to fall back on. As it is, musicians always uh, feel that I have done better than my gurus. Actually, everybody feels that, but nobody says that. As you know, we always pay lip sympathy to gurus by saying that, oh, whatever I do, he has taught me. In your mind's mind, you are saying that I am doing different than he taught me. And that's why I am better or greater or whatever it is. But uh, as you know, there are things to be said and things to be believed in. The point is that if you really want to talk of progress in music, you will have to deal with chronology. You will have to deal with principle of time. And how are you going to do that? History believes in this kind of unilinearity. History also believes in circularity, as I said. You know, the larger cultural patterns that historians have been saying, they are saying, oh, all that has happened before, and human culture is again coming back to, etc. I am reminded of what uh, Stavinsky writes. Igor Stavinsky notes that after the French Revolution has taken place, Chesterton, who was a famous humorist, essayist, he went to France. And he went to a bar. And just to make small talk, he asked the barman, I believe you had a revolution here. And the barman said, yes, we are in the same place. So that means revolution must have taken place. Because he was referring to the circularity, revolution, coming back to the same spot again. That's exactly what some historians say that human culture is going in circles, it's coming back to the same point again. Of course, straight line, circle, and there is one third now, third diagrammatical representation, which is of a spiral, which I believe in. I feel that, well, okay, we are in the same circle perhaps, but on a higher level. 
So uh, if the earlier circle was on the first floor, now I am on the second floor. So uh, the circularity is there. There is some kind of relationship also, but at the same time I am different and I am perhaps higher. And this is not an ego trip. I mean, uh, we are going to talk about it. And in what way we can talk of progress in music? And of course making historical statement. Next point which uh, occurs to me is about historian's third plank and that is objectivity. Historians always say that in India there are biographies, in India there are anecdotes and in India they would say that there are many things except history because there is no objectivity. Again, in history too, people have said that the so-called objectivity is perhaps a notion which is attractive but never realized. It is always historian's history, not history of mankind. It is Toynbee's history or, well, Thucydides' history or Herodotus, whatever. It is his point of view. There is nothing objective about it. And of course, the debates run on. But what kind of objectivity we are talking of in music? I am raising this problem because there are various schools of history which have already formulated these problems and somehow historians of music have never bothered to check what the general historians are doing with different kinds of problems whether they can take any clue from that and I would refer to those various schools of history to substantiate what I am saying. Apart from objectivity the moment you talk of this circularity, spiral, etc., etc., my question would be that can you really place musical happenings on the chronological axis? Because you will say, okay, somebody was born, we're pretty certain event, I mean there are no doubts about that, either he is born or not born. Somebody dies, very certain event. Then somebody begins his talim, somebody gives a concert, somebody takes out a record, broadcast, telecast, whatever. Are these musical events, then they can be placed on the chronological axis. Then that means you can work as the historians do. And my problem with these events is that all these are music related happenings, but whether they are musical events cannot be justified now. It's only when later on you realize that, well, history was made at that time, then you realize that that was a musical event which was really a musical event and not happening. So what I am suggesting is that it's not a rule of hindsight. I am suggesting something else. And that is that you have to make a value decision to decide that anything related with music cannot be a musical event. Now people have made distinctions like incidents, events, happenings, all these are not just words. For example, incident can be isolated. When the incidents are logically leading you towards something and that happens, that becomes an event. So that means isolated incidents might be there but they do not give you anything. But the moment they are a part of a logical pattern, then they lead you to event. So there are, you know, gradations, valuational gradations about happenings too. And history would say that everything that happens is not history. There is a valuation involved. And the moment there is a valuation, you will have to fall back on some other discipline, not history, not objectivity, not chronological placement, not geography. People have said that for history there are two eyes, geography and chronology. Well, in India, both of them are blinking all the time. The moment you start talking, kaha rehte the wo, kya malum wo, kaha yaha hi area mein the, aisa lagta hai. And we are not talking of, you know, Kalidas, we are talking of yesteryears, ten years back who was living where. 
and i am saying that these things might be important for other disciplines but perhaps for history of music they are not as important as is made out to be i am suggesting that chronology will have to be redefined i am suggesting that geographical location will have to be redefined because we are dealing with a phenomenon which is totally different than other phenomena with which history has been habitually dealing then we come to another important aspect there are schools and cools of history and there is a special way of looking at histories so historically looking at histories and people say that once you know that certain histories were written because certain conditions were operating at that time then as i said yesterday that some things can be explained but that does not mean they can be justified but every time you'll have to come in with an explanation and historians are now saying that the past histories are relying too much on causality all history is grappling with the problem that i want to explain how this has happened they give you causes and then you are happy then you feel oh this is history marathas were defeated on in the panipat battle reasons 1 2 3 4 9 10 then. then the boy gets the marks in full reasons give us reasons analyze give reasons establish cause and effect relationship and that is history now my point is that in music can you really think of cause and effect relationships do you really believe that causality plays any part in creativity causality of what type you are talking of can you pin down these causes and effects then what does that mean that again means that one more thing that means that essentially music will have to be treated on a different basis and when i am talking of music in fact i am talking of three performing arts together dance drama music but my basic evidence i have taken from music but i am quite sure that this will apply to theater too any performing art any performance whatsoever historians have been saying as i said that unless you have cause and effects you are not able to build up a rational argument about how things have taken place music history tells us that essentially even if i don't know the cause i know what has happened because essential continuity of musical traditions khayal origin of khayal the moment you say origin of khayal the temptation is of course came after what who created that when was it created now all these are pseudo problems because you are not talking of an object you can talk of origins you can talk of geographical placements you can talk of chronological placements about objects not of ideas nobody can say with certainty that this idea was born at such and such a place in this person's head and then such and such a time no ideas are in the air and somebody is there to crystallize them so for the sake of convenience we give credit to that man but actually if that man is honest enough he will say it was in the air i was a vehicle the point is that essential continuity of musical behavior should not be lost sight of i remember some instances while you read musicological texts you come across names of forms i am simplifying the argument but it will explain what i am saying you will say for example that uh, in sangeet ratnakar there is a form called swarartha now swarartha means where the note names themselves are meaning of music this is swarartha now that form under that name vanish later on you came up with sargam geet and you started saying oh this is a new form because it has a different name i am talking of essential continuity of treating the musical material 
you treat the note names as composition blocks and you come up with a composition kind console composition type do you have a right to say that i have created it this is the origin of it or you are going to say well perhaps something of this kind happened before in a different setting but there is a continuity this is the essential continuity of musical behavior that i am talking of we have studied our text superficially nobody have built up a catalog of musical forms mentioned in sangeet ratnakar and trying to identify the contemporary forms with them i have some examples as i said swarartha is one of them another i don't remember the name but as you know chaturanga is a form chaturanga has we say four aspects four integral factors etc suppose you have three then what happens then there was a form of that kind mentioned in sangeet ratnakar now if somebody comes up and say that i have only combined three and that's a new form and i am the originator of it how can you accept the argument i am saying this is the essential continuity of musical tradition musical traditions have a kind of what should i say a tendency sometimes to lose vitality become subterranean and come up again later on perhaps in a different category perhaps in a different name but there is a continuity and this is the price that you have to pay for having a long tradition you can't help it if you have a tradition of 2000 years how can you assume that better minds were never there before you they were they must have toyed with the musical material amply abundantly i remember one more form having five languages mentioned there in sangeet ratnagar now as we are only talking of art music all the time when you talk of history of music you never feel that the form is with you panchabhashik but you go to lavani you have panchabhashi lavani immediately oh the form is there in a different category of music that's why i said that unless you pay attention to all the five categories of music you do not have a right to talk of indian music and of course not to talk of history of indian music and musicology of indian music you might say i am talking of art music your own gharana mostly you are talking of yourself <laughs> the point is that somewhere indian tradition makes it very difficult as i said to be original indian tradition throws you a challenge all the time that if you really look at the earlier texts you feel oh this man has already thought of that or somebody has already thought on those lines and then of course performing problems are recurrent problems i mean whether you are dealing with the audience or with the musical material or with your own psyche or with your stage fright so these problems have been with us for last 2000 years we developed our larynx 10000 years back so from 10000 year history how many new things you can have now of course the brain is changing and i believe that 25 year hence will need different aesthetics different musicology different everything and we have to be prepared for that as it is we are not prepared for yesterday today tomorrow so day after is very difficult now i come to the next uh, major uh, section of my discussion with you that i am going to talk of some new orientations in history which i feel historians of music should take note of only then we will be able to move away from the regular historical objective statement of story of indian music firstly of course first necessity is that you have to pay attention to the new approaches which are immediately coming up all the time and that itself is a problem because as you know today communications are easy and that's why there is no communication between people earlier when there were not good roads no radios no telephones i have documentary evidence to suggest that nanya deva was aware of what abhinav gupta was doing in 50 years time you know nanya deva was in mithila 
Abhinav Gupta was working in Kashmir and they were aware of what they were doing. So communications were easier because scholastic lines were open. Now they are totally closed. And that's why new approaches in history never reach us. Even though you might have a department of history next door, we won't be able to know what he is doing. That kind of situation recurs in India. That's why this is the first thing, that we have to be alert and sensitive to what the historians are doing. Secondly, there are approaches. One of the approach is contemporary history. And what do they mean by contemporary history and what, what was the necessity they felt to have a contemporary history? Firstly, contemporary history believes that we, by ourselves, are unique. We cannot be explained by what we were before. This is a kind of belief, it says that never go to the past all the time to explain what is happening now. Look at us now carefully and that is our story, not the past. Somewhere historical statements have always been tied down with a backward look and contemporary history challenges this supposition. It says that at the most we are dealing with 70 years period. And 70 years, as you know, can, can extend to about three generations. Now I am building up this kind of hypothesis that actually three generations would also mean that where there is a kind of operative memory, that you are going to find people who would have looked at the same phenomenon but who belong to the third generation, second generation and your own generation. So this is how contemporary history helps you to talk about the present in terms of the present. This is very important. This is one sin that we always try to look at the present with the focus from the past. This is one sin. The other sin is that we look at the past with the focus of the present. This is called presentism. It is a sin, it's a term of abuse. A presentist view means that you are imposing contemporary patterns on what has happened in the past. You are rationalizing the past. Past was too irrational for your purpose, really speaking. You don't have enough evidence. You build a story to suit what you want to have. But perhaps you don't have enough evidence to do that. A contemporary history, as I say, urges you, receive the impact now, the immediacy is very important and then go back if you want to but first concentrate on what's happening now and that is contemporary history. Contemporary history of course obviously does not believe in unilinearity because otherwise they will be getting trapped again in that same chain so they don't accept that and people have said that we go back to 70 years and I uh, this is only a very arbitrary kind of placement on the chronological axis. But as I said, the logic might be of three generations, memory. And this is corroborated by the methodology which contemporary historians always advocate. And they all advocate the methodology which is followed by another important approach which is known as oral history. Contemporary historians say talk to people of three generations as I said you will get versions of the same incident which are different and which are different perspectives on the same happening. And that is history of that occasion. That is the history of that musical event. So this is oral history. Once more, oral history, as it was formulated by the non-Indian scholars, was based on their perceptions of what Africa does they cannot be applied as they are in case of India. Because oral tradition in Africa and oral tradition in India are two different things. I have written separately on oral tradition in India and oral tradition in and Hindustani music. As they are important papers, they have not been read by many. Or because uh, they have not read been by many, they must be important, whatever. <laughs> Oral history, look at this definition, oral tradition by Vansina, the arch priest of 
oral historians in the West. He says, oral tradition is oral testimony transmitted verbally from one generation to the next one or more. There he stops. Now, every word of this can be challenged because oral tradition in India does not move in this way. It does not move, for example, solely through the verbal channels. Oral tradition in India does not mean exclusion of writing and written material. It only means a cultural decision has been taken what should be written down and how much should be written down. Oral tradition in India did not become operative because we did not have enough writing material or we did not have a script. We took that decision as a culture because we felt everything need not be written down and perhaps writing down everything is damning to our future. Oral tradition believed in writing down sutras, not the explanations, because the explanations will vary from person to person. Adhikara bheda, that was the doctrine. Adhikara jaisa hoga, vaisa hi batana chahiye. Mar constant kya rahega, wo sutra mein aega. That would be written down. The point is that oral tradition and concept of oral history in India would have to be different. And the moment we are talking of oral tradition and oral history, we know that in Indian music, which believes in oral tradition and which has been carrying on its behavior in that fashion, has a special relationship with this kind of approach. Then we have an approach which is identified as urban history. Again, urban history means that you try to classify how human beings come together. For example, there can be just habitation of people. There might be a hamlet, there will be a village, there will be a city, then there will be a metropolitan city. Now all these are full of human groups, but you can't say that they are living in the same condition. All these are conditions or states of living. And that's why once you say urban history, you are referring to a particular kind of coming together of human beings. And as you know, even Satyajit Rai used to say Mahanagar Sanskriti. Metropolitan cities have a different kind of culture. We use it as a derogatory term. Wo to Bombay ka culture hai. But actually, yes, metropolitan pressures bring out a different kind of culture. In fact, I have posed this problem to many archaeologists too, and I said that how would you distinguish between a village and a town? Tell me that. What are your criteria? Are you going to say that so many people means city and so many people means village? No. So this cannot be a, this kind of criteria. What would be the criteria? Then I suggested to them, I said that the moment you are talking of village, you must have a town. Village can be defined in terms of towns and towns can be defined in terms of villages. So you can't say that industrial revolution and then we had cities, no. Arthashastra talks of villages, also of towns. Mohenjadoda, what was it? Town or a city or a village? Just because it has 10,000 people doesn't mean it was a village. There is a totality of approach which tells us now that urban history is important because urban centers are also centers of ideas. Once more you will realize that there is a kind of percolation. Metropolitan cities, cities, urban centers, villages, whatever. Then there is a percolation. So ideas which are formulated they of course propagate, they get diffused, they get distorted, whatever. Everybody contributes to that. But it's not the same thing. And urban cities are, urban centers are important because they are the creators of ideas. Good or bad, we are not sitting in judgment on that. We are saying they are creators of ideas. That's important. Now, in musical parlance, it will immediately come to your mind that seats of patronage or capitals should be our centers, should be points for reference. That is where music has really changed and given up many ideas to us. And when I say patronage seeds, I am also including temples, religious seeds, as you know, mats and everything that happened in India. Next, of course, there are 
various schools which have good names subaltern studies and history from below which is a very dramatic name history from below the protest is of course that you have been concentrating on the ruling class the rulers and the elites and actually history and historical development takes place in other classes so you start from those classes and build up your historical argument once more we can have a close parallel if you want to write history of music start from as i said primitive music come to folk music come to religious music come to art music come to popular then you will have this so these are the neglected classes you which you will have to pay attention to then uh, people have talked of area study as a very serious approach this is because number 1 every area is a challenge because of multiplicity of cultures which mix in when they say area they are not referring to city as you know you can talk of regions but regions are politically defined that's why we are not talking of regions we are saying areas now these areas can be linked up further and we can talk of zonal culture and mind you i have used this term zonal history and zonal culture even before rajiv gandhi inaugurated the zonal cultural centers so this has nothing to do with official policies my definition of zones is closely tied up with geographical contiguity i came across findings that in maharashtra what's happening can be explained entirely only if i pay attention to the nearby areas like say gujarat andhra pradesh karnataka goa unless i know what is happening there i can't understand maharashtra properly so then this becomes a cultural zone for me the moment you shift your base of operation the zone also changes because these are cultural boundaries they are not regional boundaries they are not political demarcations as ethnomusicology tells us you will have to have different kind of cartography if you follow musical lines of development that cartography would never recognize pakistan as a separate state never recognize bangladesh as a separate state because musically they come in the same area but this is what i mean by zonal center zonal culture then of course once more with the communication picture changing so explosively and effectively later on perhaps not today but you will have an occasion to talk about universal history you can't say that i have understood indian music and i am able to write history of indian music without paying attention to what's happening in america because now indian music is also happening in america you can't say that anything which happens in the geographical boundaries is indian music no indian music is stylistically defined not geographically defined and that's why you will have to go back to that attractive word universal history if you remember many many titles of this type came up earlier when people did not have enough data but they had a belief that if they pay attention to various sources they will be able to get a universal picture and that was of course a dream but now perhaps there is a possibility that we can have these many sources and we can have a very responsible response to this situation that take into consideration all that is happening and then talk of indian music uh, then uh, there are some other approaches i have brought them together for the sake of convenience cultural history history of material culture and intellectual history mind you all these are approaches developed by historians but they are dealing with specific data and we are dealing with music and performing arts at the most as i said now what is a cultural history of course look at this definition and you will realize that this definition is too airy too ethereal to be translated into action immediately there was a school which went against that and the definition was corrected but this definition even as a dream is very good cultural history is a study of themes symbols concepts ideals styles and sentiments very easy 
so immediately people felt no you are talking of airy nothings so there was as i said history of material culture people immediately took a pendulum swing and they said no talk of every object that you use we will say from pin to piano the usual thing talk of pin to piano analyze them analyze the usage analyze who uses them how uses them why uses them and that is your history mind you all these approaches are negating the usual definition of history which always looks to the past they are now in my way i will put it that they are using the past to understand the present so that they would be able to shape the future this is how history is now developing history is not now a backward glance now as a counter attack on this material culture approach intellectual history or history of ideas where approaches which were developed people felt no you can't talk of objects and deal with objects as if they are only objects after all objects are results of ideas so ideas are the important things and that's why intellectual history or history of ideas of course there are many other complicating factors for example history of ideas believes that when you say science literature religion philosophy you are unnecessarily fragmenting the human consciousness they say that actually there is an idea which pervades these various fields and basically the idea is important not the manifestations which are these small fragments and that's why they will say nature is an idea human being is an idea so they will identify the ideas first and then they will go along collecting data interpreting it etc etc one more factor now as we are at that argument here you will also realize that objectivity as it was understood has been given a goodbye to objectivity the antonym is not subjectivity to objectivity the antonym is really interpretative you are interpreting you are believing that things cannot be said as that racine i remember the french writer and dramatist he said that when i say i understand shakespeare i mean i understand shakespeare in relation to me so there is nothing like understanding shakespeare as an object i understand me in relation to me so everything is a matter of interpretation there is nothing like objectivity and the usual binary division object and subject objectivity and subjectivity is not accepted there is now this nuance entered into our picture and that says that interpretative is the antonym for objectivity then there is a one fall out of the earlier intellectual history and history of idea school and it talked of spirit of age concept said that every age is kind of inspired by one moving idea the age is ruled over by that idea the idea is so inspiring that everybody is under the shadow of that idea and still feels i am giving the sunlight and that's why the sight jays the spirit of the age thing then of course people immediately say that oh nationalism spirit of the age everything to be interpreted through that idea that nationalistic music nationalistic literature nationalistic stance the way you sit the way you stand up everything is nationalistic there of course one realizes that for a short period in history for short temporal durations this may happen ideas may take hold of the total human psyche in a society and human beings might try to express themselves in a kind of fashion which immediately reflects on that basic idea and that's why spirit of age has been a very popular kind of notion and it has paid dividends sometimes the other approach is comparative history in india again of high relevance if you are talking of say what happens in maharashtra 
in 1910 try to think what's happening in gujarat in 1910 in andhra pradesh in whatever and that would immediately establish many links of which you are not aware it will also cure you of that you know specific uh, regional pride that you might have that so much has been done by this person this person's work was made possible because so many others were working there and they were not perhaps aware of each other that does not matter and this is where a comparative history will have a special relevance in india yesterday i don't know whether i mentioned in these many words but this is what i would like to say that india politically we are a nation but culturally we are a federation and every region has its own dynamism and unless we are aware of these we won't be able to get a fuller picture which we need to have i don't remember who the author was but a greek historian i think it was polybius he wrote history and he developed a method and he said my method is alternative chapters history that means he will write about say 1900 whatever bc in athens one chapter next chapter would be during the same period what's happening in in other known parts of the world so alternate chapters would be written and they were supposed to lead to each other reflect on each other and this was of course comparative history he was not only emphasizing similarities he was also emphasizing the dissimilarities and perhaps trying to tell you that well there is nothing like one particular truth but there are truths and truths and truths and the object of history should be to arrive at truths not truth next uh, approach which was developed at one point of time it was known as ethno history but when the westerners formulated this approach they felt that they need some special technique to study pre literate societies again in india this can't happen we were literate and still we did not believe in the efficacy of writing we believed in oral tradition so what happens to ethno history well approaches come and go but the basic logic is that well they felt that you must have a special technique to deal with them instead of saying they don't have a history that is the most important part the historians did not say that oh these people they don't write they don't have a history they didn't say that they said okay now we need a special set of apparatus now then they formulated a discipline which now has fallen in disuse because as you know ethnomic ecology has developed its tools and strategies which are more efficient another approach which less dramatically is known as social history and more dramatically it is known as everyday studies they say that what is happening now in common man's life is the most important thing we believe of course that this is important but we don't develop a kind of study approach to that every day history does that again i am saying that this kind of approach is very close to popular music as a category how would you study for example the jingles jingles are a very important format a form a genre in popular music jingles take hold of children as well as elderly people as musicologists as persons interested in all categories of music i should study the jingles properly i should have a history of them who used what kind of instruments when how much language was used what kinds of voices what were the visuals which went on why those visuals how many symbols how many universal symbols how many private symbols caste symbols whatever this would be dealing with that genre and it would give us a definite and a different insight into what is happening in music of that kind one more approach which came near to contemporary history but which was formulated for a while in 19th century is known as historicism somehow it later on got twisted and the opposite was put forward as it there's a content of it but at that time in its origin it meant that every historical age 
has to be judged in terms of that age itself again the concept of justice was in the forefront you can't judge the present with the spectacles which you have been given from the past and vice versa and that's why this approach was formulated one more approach which should appeal to us i have seen so many people trying to do phd's on individual musicians now that this approach must be a very dear one to our psyche it seems it's called it is called psycho history it says that you have to treat every historical event as as an upshot of an individual who is making it possible and that means you have to go not only to one person but you have also to enter his mental setup etc and of course as you know freud and jung and all those people were they are ready to help you there and you can have a biography which will not be a biography placed on a chronological and geographical axis but which will be study of that person and that would be psycho history because you are as i said traversing in three tenses ultimately history would mean that you are linking up past with the present for the future that is history and that's where these approaches are trying to give us new insights finally there are two approaches which appeal to scientific minds that is once more people were getting disturbed by uh, so much of normative character coming into history nothing definite they said so quantitative history came up and as one offshoot of it was serial history Now, quantitative history means that you collect lot of statistical data over a number of years say 50 years period and then you analyze the trends and then you say oh this was a continuity of the earlier trend or it was a discontinuity of the earlier trend and this was the quantitative aspect as you know economic history can do that people have been doing it in various areas but these are about 15 approaches which historians have formulated to deal with different problems and as i have suggested to you each of them has a relevance to musical situation provided we bid good by to the usual definition of history that we have in mind that history is something to be written when you burn lot of midnight oil well it's not that history is something just as adhyatma to be done when you are old people say similarly history to be read when you are nothing else to do no history to be read when you cease to be a performer no history to be read when you want to be a better performer yes because history means all this as i said there are various ways and i have applied some of them perhaps uh, we can have discussion at this stage or when i finish one or two more points because these points now are definitely data kind and this thus far i have been discussing concepts so if you like to have a discussion about the concepts now welcome but otherwise i will present two case studies and then we can have discussion whatever suits okay right i feel that in india how many things are accepted as history and then i could see that descriptions analysis narrative annals chronicles biographies have been put forward as histories now all of them have a historical content but they are not histories that's what i am saying all of them have a historical content then of course i have made distinctions with the help of other historians and touched upon problems like for example the nature of reasoning in music history where i have touched upon causation etc it comes here then what use music history another problem then the issue of chronology which i have already referred to 
then issue of what is hindustan and what is hindustani music this again as you know has uh, unnecessarily gathered cobwebs of misinformation in 1857 the word hindu and hindustan both have been defined both have been entered as dictionary entries by people who were trying to study india and by people who were outsiders so you know it's an interesting kind of definition how they thought of hindu hindu molsworth now this is from molsworth molsworth says hindu is a persian word it means black then he says applied by the persians to ethiopians black arabians indians etc this is hindu in 1857 as understood by non indian then hindustan again persian word the country of the hindus hindustan or india the word is especially understood as the upper provinces or region to the north of the narmada river hindustani is relating to that country so it has nothing to do with hindu religion it has nothing to do with what we are thinking today as of hindu this is a totally different way of looking at things so this is how we have been defining hindustan and today hindustani music it covers 71.5% of the total population in india because it is practiced in maharashtra gujarat rajasthan haryana punjab himachal pradesh jammu and kashmir madhya pradesh uttar pradesh orissa bihar west bengal goa diu daman delhi and chandigarh mind you i have not taken northeast here because i definitely suggest that northeast has a different kind of music to call it hindustani music is a misnomer it is unjustified unwarranted and unexplainable the moment you listen to that music you listen to different kinds of sounds different kinds of poetry different kind of coming together of various musical sources and still we continue to have this notion that we have two art music systems hindustani and karnataka it's not true anyway uh, this was one of the problems which i have touched upon and then now i suggest that with all these historical approaches in the background and with all the categories posing problems for us with all the media trying to be helpful and with so many research grants coming to people who are not interested in research <laughs> so i feel that perhaps history of hindustani music can be written if we pay attention to these five aspects one is patronage second is musical forms thirdly musical instruments fourthly mobility of music and musicians and finally relationship with language and other entertainment media i'm not suggesting language is an entertainment media i'm suggesting relationship with language and other entertainment media if we do this perhaps we will have a chance of having a reasonably honest historical presentation of hindustani music i'm not saying successful or complete etc but reasonably honest after that taking a cue from bhatkhande and of course many others one realizes that hindustani music is not ancient if you make a distinction between say arvachin and adhuna then it is arvachin it's not ancient not prachin so beginning from the 12th century taking a cultural backdrop i have analyzed three texts one is bharat bhashya by nanya deva the other one is by jyoti reshwara and the text is varna ratnakara now this is not a musicological text but as i suggested to you yesterday what appears in non musicological text and is about music gives you a better data sometimes 
because that is how music has been received by the general public what comes in a general work is perhaps the lcm of music at that time and that also gives you something and this jyotireshwara is a very perceptive observer and that's why i have taken his text then we have gunyat ul munya a persian text edited by sarmadi again a different kind of uh, look at hindustani music later on of course we have the muslim political backdrop mind you i am not saying cultural backdrop cultural backdrop was not muslim cultural backdrop was indian but the political backdrop was muslim so arabs turks afghans and moguls that all together makes the muslim political backdrop and then on that background you analyze two movements one is of course the bhakti movement the other one sufi movement and that is what takes you to as i said the formative period of hindustani music which takes you till 16th century 17th century later than that of course people have been writing and of course all this can be further elaborated but this is the general map for writing history of hindustani music now i will only talk about bharat bhashya nanya deva and his bharat bhashya are important for two reasons one is that nanya deva perhaps represents the ideal patron performer theoretician all rolled into one and that's why nanya deva is important nanya deva is important because he comes at the end of bharata's line and he has not begun the next line his period is 1097 to 1133 it just precedes manasollas manasollas is 1131 nanya deva comes from mithila so you know the region and you know what happens there climate wise everything etc but i am on this backdrop i'm now i'm talking of nanya deva work as giving us a clue to hindustani music of course historical development related to that nanya deva is perhaps the very early example of a performer patron theoretician a category as rare as a philosopher king as i mentioned earlier nanya deva was a very keen follower of the scholastic tradition we know that abhinav gupta died in 1030 and nanya deva has written after 1097 he has already referred to abhinav gupta so what i am suggesting a very alert person who is keeping a tab on what's happening in kashmir and other areas of india his allegiance is to bharata is brought out by the titles etc and at the same time his deviations from bharata are also noteworthy very interestingly in raga names tal names jati everywhere he does not give a single indication of accepted islamic influence on music this again is very interesting we are talking of as i said 11th century and still musical influences have not reached that and he has not mentioned that anywhere he has deviated from as i said the earlier tradition a very telling example is that naradya shiksha as you know mentions the names of notes and a sequence in which dh and ni are in inverse order here is a person who says no that's not the order the order should be dhani or nidha but not inverse now this is a very major deviation i don't have to tell you you are all musicians here then nanya deva is a very early example of musicologists borrowing varied concepts from grammarians who were sticking to the older definition of music for example 
grammarians employed concepts of ucha and uchchatara nodes you know they are making pitch differentiations earlier people were happy to use the same terms but nanya deva says no he says krishth and vikrishth for ucha and uchchatara he has substituted these nodes because now he is moving away from grammar he is suggesting that i am a musician i am examining the musical behavior so i must have my own terminology which differs from the grammarian tradition so he notes that then he also talks of uh, krishta and atiswara have been added etc emphasizes that bias of singers of samas was this but later on it was completed so now what he believes in the completed saptaka is not referring to the earlier one he also talks of grammars but interestingly three authors refer to shadja grama as shadja pradhan which i feel is extremely interesting matanga abhinav gupta and nanya dev are the three people who refer to shadja grama as shadja pradhan grama i am not reading tonality into this reference but i am suggesting that well to move away from shadja grama which was an accepted term to shadja pradhan definitely suggests some way of thinking about it that perhaps if i am giving so much importance to this fundamental and how to construct my octave on that then i must have another term it's not just shadja gram it is shadja pradhan and that i think is important enough then of course etymological explanation of swara which uh, nanya dev gives is very interesting he is talking first of swayam atmanam ranjayati not rajate you know that not luster etc but ranjayati he is talking of something different here making that word ranjayati makes a deviation from just having that note as the prominent note not just prominent but adding to the color of music and that i think is something then of course he talks of first time two new intervals kaishika gandhar and nishad which have been later mentioned but nanya dev is the first to talk of these subtle variations and obviously the moment you have subtler tonal intervals coming in the music has changed otherwise you don't have to refer to them the music was definitely different as i said uh, he comes at the end of a line of bharatas and the second line has not started that is we have still hangover of the murchana but we are moving away from murchana if the earlier theoreticians have mentioned murchanas of seven notes here is the first person who says the murchana has to go all the eight notes murchana has to move to eight notes octave this again is a very important departure again interesting bharat matanga and nanya dev describe 33 musical embellishments while sharang dev enumerate 63 again you see the difference that that was the end of the line they agreed on that because they refer to the same tradition but from sharang deva and of course i would like to tie this up with developments in poetics as you know alankara shastra was developing side by side look at the number of alankaras at that period and you will realize that there perhaps those spirit of the age thing was counting we were going in for differentiation subtler differences nuances coming up with new formulations even gamakas as you know nanya deva enumerate seven ratnagara gives you 15 and somnatha gives you 19 number of gamakas increasing means what you have other formulations of organizing your tonal material and you are of course moving from the intonation patterns that you have nanya deva's definition of wadi is so accommodative that that definition takes over all the functions of nyasa and graha swaras again that suggests to you that he is moving towards anibaddha music where nyasa and graha has become superficial and that's why wadi is the only important thing left nanya deva again establish is rasa and swara equation in case of rushabh dhavata both komal 
तीव्र म गंधार एंड निषाद कैशी की माइंड यू द मोमेंट यू हैव दिस स्मॉलर टोनल इंटरवर्स एस्टाब्लिश एज इक्वेटिंग विथ सर्टन रसाज यू आर एडिंग टू द कॉर्पस ऑफ द रस आर्ग्यूमेंट नाउ रस आर्ग्यूमेंट इज नॉट बेस्ड ऑन ब्रॉडर सेंटिमेंट्स यू आर टाइंग टू हैव को रिलेटिव एंड द को रिलेटिव आर गेटिंग सटलर एंड सटलर दिस इज वॉट हैपन्स इन केस ऑफ नान्य देव नाव द नेक्स्ट वुड बी ज्योतिरेश्वर फ्रॉम मिथिला इंटरेस्टिंगली ज्योतिरेश्वर ट्वेल्व एटी टू थर्टीन फोर्टी You can check your periods from Ratnakara also. What was the Ratnakara period? And look at this; um, they were almost contemporaries. And it's interesting that he, this man, was also a, a theatre person. As you know, the first real farce, as it is known, Dhurta Samagama, was written by Jyoti Reshwar. Now, the moment it. it is known to us that he is a theater person <clears throat> some things become very clear for example he has given prominence to certain forms which are not musical forms but which are discourse forms storytelling for that matter or he has described a form called varnana vannak he defines as that and of course music going on with it so vannak then he calls it chapters kallola and there are of course uh, many kallolas but first kallola has descriptions of lower caste criminal types beggars as well as mendicants i talked to you yesterday of categories of music that unless you really pay attention to all these castes this is now history coming up from below he is talking of all these classes Fifth Kallola, he gives us a forest description and sixteen tribes. Then reference to haunting songs of Kinnaras and Gandharvas. He talks of Vidyadhara as the main Gandharva and gives a definition as well as a, a description of their music. Then he refers to uh, wind instruments, etc., etc. Then there is a seventh Kallola in which seventy-two princely families are listed. i talked of patronage as a major source he is a person who has already done it then place names are given and which do not suggest still muslim influence though there is one name khurasana which is a bit interesting either you know those who have transcribed the name might be incorrect but we have to ponder over this whether it was it had anything to do with khurasan or anything to do with islamic influence this is about jyotireshwar as i said there are two more texts but i think i have covered enough ground and i have suggested to you that all the historical approaches that we have talked of are not airy bookish approaches they have been followed and the approaches become viable if somebody works following that approach and people have been working and people have been throwing up suggestions all this together perhaps would make a contribution to writing of hindustani music history as i visualize it i would like to visualize it thank you ashok you said in the earlier part of your speech that Ideas are not born like a product, and they so they evolve over a period of time. But they form, like shall, for instance. Then there is a product which is born, or a form which is born. While ideas float over a period of time, they crystallize at a given time into a form which is born. And would you not say that for there is a specific period? which can be earmarked that these ideas crystallize at a given time i would say that there can be a specific period for an object but not for the idea as such because the idea has been there yeah. and if you want to write a history of it i am saying that you can't stop by object stage you have to go back have forward whatever 
and then only you will be able to write history of it because essential argument is that history would mean you are linking up past present and future why do you use the word evolution because evolution would mean as you know i mean it has gathered those overtones now that what comes later is better than the earlier one so we are not suggesting that i am i would go by change i would accept the term change because you know i mean why was referring to that an idea is crystallized into a form that is a sort of evolution don't you think so well i won't use that term because i am unhappy with the term evolution as i am unhappy with the term revolution <laughs> i would accept change i would also differentiate between qualitatively as an institution i would have arguments over that but i would accept first the possibility that every change is an action which has to be noted by historians firstly you know you have to say that there were individuals and not one individual yeah. and the moment the moment you say that you know the point of chronology the point of you know genesis that genealogy who is to be credited with that disappears and i would say that you know perhaps one has to realize that bone of historical statement and not you know what is happening that whatever is objectively notable you take that and then build your history from that instead of that let us go by musical ideas and then if you come across chronological placement accept them but what is more logical would be evolution of ideas and thereby evolution i would only mean that there will be a logical connection between a and b b and c whatever बिकॉज you you have not told us what kind of music was meant by that khyal term you are only referring to the term khyal but the term does matter but unless we know the connotation of the term how can you take the term what does it mean to us it has relation with some you know some you know rc namdev says khyal tape gati in 1300 what does that mean Do you mean to say that Khyal was there in 1300? So the term cannot guide us anywhere. If you remember yesterday what we said about etymology and terms, they don't talk about the thing in itself. The very existence of that term would only mean that there was something at that time which was known as Khyal. But perhaps you know, musically it might be totally different. You know, this is presentism. we are imposing contemporary patterns on what has happened before and i won't call it irrational but i would call it non rational view of history which tolstoy talked of i remember if you remember war and peace in war and peace there is of course a general who says that 
battle now 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 and there is of course the russian general kutuzov he says that nothing happens in war because you want to do it he waits waits and waits and waits then suddenly one morning he senses the cold wind coming in he sniffs his nose like a dog and he says now the time has come to attack because nature has told us that winter is coming and then of course tolstoy says that the pattern of wars as you know wars are very important themes for writing histories and then tolstoy says that war happened somebody won not because somebody did something but the total pattern was sent to us non rationally and people have said that presentism really means that that you construct the past to suit your present perhaps not justifiable and i don't know why we should be interested in showing that khyal came to us from 13th century or 12th century i would suggest that khyal with us today then i will go back okay fine and i will come up to you know performing reality would suggest examine the compositions you have today no what i am suggesting is that you know sadaranga became a rallying force for people who wanted to compose similar songs i am not saying he didn't compose anything but later on as you know i mean now we compose and we sadaranga naam dal dete hain because it becomes acceptable easily no i mean that's different but what i am suggesting you get the hang of the argument that you know don't go by that mudra there Take the history of ideas as the main plank. Yes. Would you give uh, some emphasis, some importance to the linear history? See, chronological history. Chronology would come in after I have identified the musical ideas. Yes, granted that. Then, of course, why not? Then you can't ignore the. but nobody has said that i am saying that you have to begin with musical ideas then go to chronology and geography not the other way that's one way of understanding to think so you think so you go this way you go this way no 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 one way of understanding these are the different perceptions of taking the hold of the entire thing you can call it holistic view whatever name you like to give to it i won't call it by any other name i will only call it by history of ideas and musical idea not music related ideas how would you evaluate uh, such statements like say our music was one at, at one time say by kapila vatsayana janak sharmadi that music changed i won't accept it do i would say that janab sarmadi didn't i don't think he said that one our music was one no he puts his own this is in such a way that nuru husain and janab uh, kabila watsan for persons like that who have some historical uh, sense perhaps and in the kala sutra series by india what do you think of that no but sarmadi statement that music was one in this country i don't think he could have made that statement because he is preface to gunyatul munya and his other papers make a different kind of the later one statement the recent one no even the recent one i don't think well i have not no but i don't think he could have made that statement because his view of middle age medieval period in fact he refuses to accept that as dark age and medieval period etc and it's interestingly dwivedi also says the same thing hazari prasad would so come also with a similar argument that in india you cannot have a periodization which is secular for us 
Kali Yuga. This is Kali Yuga. Our periodization would mean that. And I have said it somewhere that if at all I am interested in periodization about musical history, then I would have periodization based on musicological texts. Why should I go in for kings? My periodization would begin, say, as I say, Naradi, Hiksha, Bharata, Pej, Ratnakara, whatever. And of course, all the Prakrut works to be considered and all that. But basically, the starting point should be what? Starting point should be musical idea. That's what I am saying. They are more or less dependent upon the nomenclature of Ragas, common. And the <coughs> and Edge like that, and Kabila also come to that sort of. Uh, yes, because they are only reading history and art music. No, I mean they are only concerned with the names of Ragas, that's all. That means art music. And I am saying all the time that no. One and half percent, three and half percent of musical reality is art music. Very, very, very deceptive and very elitist, totally unacceptable. And at the same time you have your Utsavas and folk artists and giving awards and saying our folk art. You refer to 121 musical treatises over a period of time. You refer to three main Nanya Dev Jyoteshwara and Now people like us are uh, Wonderstruck on one side and uh, confused on the other and worried on the third. <laughs> In the sense that uh, the desire to, to understand about these great authors and, uh, is naturally prominent, uh, predominant in all of us who are sitting here, I'm quite sure I'm talking on behalf of everyone. Would you suggest uh, what is a an easy, uh, I'm sorry, the word easy is wrong, what is a, uh, an efficient method of understanding all these uh, great authors without uh, having knowledge, deep knowledge of Sanskrit, without having the time and inclination to go through each and every author which you must have done. So I'm asking you, is there any method whereby, uh, and I'm, uh, this is a very serious question, I'm not uh, asking in a lighter way at all, where uh, a, an initiated student of music, and I'm not talking of a common average uh, person, but an initiated student of music who's deeply involved, who is interested <coughs> in the historical background, can uh, and have access to, uh, to what these great people have done. A non-serious answer is make grants. <laughs> and make grants. Research grants, right. And seriously, I agree with you and I feel it's possible. We will have to, for example, have a project where various people come together, <coughs> divide among houses that I will give summaries of these particular books or whatever it is, but they will have to be much more than table of contents brought together. Yeah, and that's why if we are able to do that, then it becomes accessible. And you know, if you remember yesterday I talked of four orientations of these classes. There, there are manuals, koshas, etc. There are four orientations. Now people are, uh, have aptitudes for certain kind of orientations. We have enough people in India, but they will have to be brought together and getting good summaries of these classics and not only giving summaries, but relating them to the contemporary practice. That would help. And if you remember, I am talking of Swarartha, etc. Deepak is not present today. I told Deepak that you read Ratnakara and he has given you Karanas for instrument playing. Try to identify what you are doing with the description there. For example, I remember first time I heard Pandit Ravi Shankar ji and others on the Tarfaz, you knew the dhar 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 kaite ham log usko, dhar 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 ki aisa, pehla bol de. That is called Nakha Kartari in Ratnakar. Now don't you feel that this is very important to know that the present Karana, that the present Nikas jo kar rahe aap, 
उसके लिए वहां एक लफ्ज है एंड इट टैलीज विद डिस्क्रिप्शन सो दिस इज हाउ इट विल गेट रिलेटेड एंड यू नो द लार्जर क्वेश्चन विच वी हैव बीन डिस्कस ऑफ एंड ऑन दैट the scholastic tradition and the performing tradition are really speaking from the same source that is pers so there must be a relationship between the two granting that you know scholarly tradition will always lag behind the performing tradition the scholastic tradition will wait till this performing practice has consolidated it has been accepted then it will say okay now we accept it just as in case of lexicographers a word comes into being and it is being circulated and it gets convinced that this is a word now which has arrived then you include that in the dictionary but you wait i was talking <coughs> from the performance point of view uh, so frankly yesterday i had raised this issue about uh, the the distance being created more and increasingly between uh, the scholastic tradition as you call it and the performing tradition and i think our today's performers uh, By and large, are not aware of the academics of, of music, and I think this this over a period of time would be highly prejudicial yeah. and highly harmful. Uh, and uh, therefore, uh, what I was asking a little while ago, whether there is any possibility of having scholastic tradition <coughs> put on paper in a simple, not simplistic, but a simple and easy to follow manner. Then I think the students of music who are at least partially educated, if not fully, would would benefit tremendously. Sure, that can be done. It can be done. It can be done. Uh, laughingly, uh, in a little lighter way, that grants. Yes, but I think we can work towards it uh, in all seriousness because I think this this is the crux of uh, what you are saying, sir. Great. You know, you remember I talked to you some time back. I said. one of my plans was to have an audio dictionary behlawa how kitna description dene se aapko pata chalega behlawa kya hai gamak kya hai so let me have a audio dictionary give a definition of it and have an audio dictionary have it on sitar have it on sarangi have it in vocal kam se kam ye hoga ki somebody will come up and say this is not gamak this is the gamak fine no problem but at least you know you will have a relationship establish between what you are doing and what it may mean in scholastic tradition or it might have meant and this is quite true i mean now with all the media to help us these problems are no more problems they are only action plans and there are possibilities immense possibilities because i feel that indian music is now represented as an alternative system of music in our last seminar there were so many who seriously put forth this term and we felt very happy because people are saying now the oh this is an alternative system of music in the world map and there if they really ask you questions which are pin pointed we go by saying our glorious tradition of 2500 years etc there are nothing no answers somewhere i was trying to think of it people were in once upon a time so meticulous one person devoted i am told at least 10 years of his life to decide which was the date on which kali yuga started and i have that date somewhere it was 13th of february 3020 bc the point i am making is that people were concerned about periodization according to the light of the day light of this country they said that for all of us periodization cannot be like medieval etc when in what could be they say kali yuga kali yuga when did it start this is the date just as people are spending time to decide on the date on which mahabharata war started i mean these are the kinds of things which need to be included in our as a totality of input for us and then this is possible but definitely needs organization as well as you know motivation uh, this is not a glittering job i mean this doesn't hit headlines 
but at the same time yes this is possible and i am quite sure performance will benefit because this is nothing but performance nothing but performance one related question if i may ask you no no my 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 question is i do feel i don't know whether uh, audience will agree with it but uh, today's musical uh, performers and i'm not calling them disciples but performances um uh, are devoid if i may use a strong word of the content of music and are fully almost fully focused on the expression part and i do feel that uh, the lack of academic knowledge or scholastic part uh, has been responsible uh, for the lack of content would you like to comment true why true no uh, one turns to history because you know one has a problem and one says that if you want to understand the problem try to understand the history of the problem that's how you understand the problem and that's how you solve it that's why any performing problem has a history because this is performing history this is music ideas and that's why this will immediately help a performer but we have to <coughs> we have to have a history which is related to practice you know the way history has been taught in universities the way musicology has been taught in the universities doesn't get related to musical practice and that's why students feel oh this is bookish nobody has to wo to pandit hai becomes a term of abuse but actually this is a close relationship and that's why i think they are mutually reflective studies unfortunately there has been a gap in the tradition and we don't have performer theoreticians this is once more i mean i'm repeating myself i know but it has been my uh, insistence for last 25 years that performers should write on music and their own art because that will really relate theory and practice because they will have the expression they will have the experience even if they use a wrong word doesn't matter those who know the words don't have the experience so it is better to have somebody who knows the experience doesn't know the language yes uh, you have mentioned that this the period of this contemporary history is about 70 years because of the generation i talk about music and history it was the same room when we had a seminar on what is good music when we had played some good music and uh, the people <coughs> in, in the audience found that that music was not something that we could appreciate so in the terms of musical history we used to define that period as about 70 years no, the so for, is, uh, yeah. for the purpose of contemporary history i mean i think no, you no, have no, you were no, used no. of contemporary this is 70 years for general history for musical history it is it the 70 years or even less because i, I think that, that day we found that something that was uh, what place 1913 40 we all said why no very interesting you snarl you know that recording of bartakula khan right 1904 and we never told them that this is bartakula right then they said who are you they can you said bartakula then they felt ashamed we told them later <laughs> actually actually they should have said So that's so why we can define it for Siddharth. The point is that the point is that at that point of development, that was an idiom. Mm -hmm. This idiom was built on, and that's why the contemporary idiom becomes possible. But here you are saying a kind of development, and which development really means logical connections between what has gone before and what is today and what can come tomorrow. So all the time, historical sense would include all the three tenses together. as a kind of continuum and at the same time we have to make this kind of dis distinction where contemporary historians have been saying that you are looking too much in the past and that's why they said no present stimulus present impact and we we are the raw material of history this is a weightage you know this is a problem yeah, coming back to that to uh, the thing of what you have just now so that means even on 1904 We could not identify that as a part of contemporary music. So that means even a period of 70 years is too long 
to be called a contemporary musical period. These approaches, even if you say 70 instead of let's say 100, it doesn't matter. Actually, what we are thinking about is that yes, we are making a kind of distinction about qualitative, you know, differentiation. That this happens in how many generations? Perhaps you would also know that if you now study the dynamics of change, I say sometimes that in coming 25 years, what has happened in 100 years will be superseded in 10 years. Because the dynamics of change is now different. That will have to be accounted. So I, I have a several questions. Record her, please. I have a couple of questions. Uh, one is, uh, I think, in a way related to what you talked so far. And then it does not use it, uh, not go back to somewhere else. That is one. <laughs> I think it is. No, I will go. Uh, while answering, I will do that. <laughs> Second is, I think it is uh, Ananda Vardhana who talked about Rasa, Rasika, and Rasa Grahana. And in that, he raised the point that, as was raised just now, not only the artist, but even the Rasika or the listener should be trained to appreciate music so that there is a higher level of give and take as the master of business. Would you like to address these two concepts? If you are referring to Ananvardhana, once again I would say that he was talking of elite literature. That's number one. At that level I accept that. Because acquisition of taste is a precondition for the elite music. At the same time, a good work of art appeals simultaneously at many levels. If there are seven levels, four of them would reach everybody. All the seven would not reach everybody, but a large segment would reach. Then we say it's a great work of art. So actually great work of art is not giving you a single message, never. There are multiple messages. We receive some, some others receive others, but there is a range of acceptance of messages and that makes it acceptable. So when you know we are referring to these kind of uh, rasa, and appreciation, yes, it training can help you. But at the same time, one has to accept this too, that training would mean you are perhaps neglecting the other categories, where it's not training, but instinctive response is the main thing. Might, quite true. But no, I have a very interesting example here. I have been giving music appreciation courses from 1968 and precondition for enrolling this course was that you should not be a musician. That was the precondition. And of course I invited IR from many persons but I said no. Because when you are a trained musician, whatever may be your abilities, personal abilities, you are preconditioned. And I am trying to open up minds here by playing them bird songs and whale songs and asking them that, would you like this? How is it? How would you rate it? So the point is that yes, if there is a larger spectrum of responses available, then that appreciation helps. But otherwise, you know, appreciation would mean only passing on grammatical information. And that I don't agree with. We played recording which we were about 100 years old. And we found that the top rank practicing musicians were not happy with that. Then I want to ask uh, what Avin Bhai is saying that if we go back to 12th century and 16th century and just look at the academic literature and whatever they are written, eh, then in what way they are practicing musicians going to benefit or to improve upon their performance? Because the recording material itself is <coughs> not satisfactory or useful. Then Will this confine only to uh, scholars or pandas or <coughs> only in the curriculum of the text of the university curriculum? Excuse me, uh, I, mean, I, I think what the, I had asked that it, it was not something that was not useful, but that by and large the 
top part is sitting here. They 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 some of you know find it very interesting. While the game and certain forms is very useful, but that was personally not very interesting on the point of view of of the person of the the community sitting here. So that matter is that matter is related to your performance. So your listening. Four hundred is not available at all. What is available only is good and text and idea. So this is the point I was like. That the concept. I am not talking about the concept of scholastic value, not the performance value. Uh, I personally feel that uh, whatever little I could gather from the past, in terms of vocal music, as he yesterday very correctly stated, that Brutia uh, was taken out and then instrumental music was taken out, etc. Uh, and I think that's a very, very correct statement uh, from the point of view. Whatever little study I have made. But I do feel that conceptually we are going astray. Conceptually, and that is where uh, I mean I think Ashok only told me the other day that in uh, uh, one of the books is written that there are twenty two ways in which your Mukharavid should behave when you are seeing it. Now this is a concept. How it actually was translated into practice is another matter. Ashok, I'm sorry, I I I just clarified my own point of view. You can kindly. I mean, if you ask a question of uses of history to a performer, many a times it so happens that there is a recurrence of performing problems, and the description and the information given there solves that problem. For example, I will give you a very interesting example here. If you look at the Kutupa arrangement of Bharata. how vadya vrund was arranged in bharata nobody has drawn a diagram about that but various descriptions give you this diagram that is a semi circle at the center is the mardangika to his right and left instrumentalis then the vocalis my question is this Occurred to me when I was doing my theatre project that what is the distance of these various sound sources from the audience? The instrument which is going to make maximum sound is farthest from the audience. At the same time, it is providing rhythm to both the other wings, so it has to be at the centre. the moment this became clear to me this solved problems of theater acoustics for me where my performer should be in my speech training classes we used to wonder about that that what could be the position for a particular actor for a particular dialogue it is dictated by how many things and supposing that he has to turn away from the ideal position then we should change the dialogue in such a way that dialogue which has to reach them will have the minimum distance to travel from the source to the receiver otherwise you will have a gesture which is a delayed gesture which follows and doesn't happen simultaneously with the dialogue this i could realize when i understood bharata's arrangement of kutapa and that's why i feel that well performing problems are going to recur and that definitely gives you a solution also about you know how to create new music i mean how do you find these principles if you remember yesterday i talked of grammatical principles and one of them was it said is give you a theorem it gives you a formula which you can apply in various conditions and it gives you something new for example if i say ki changing the sequence is the formula it can be applied in thousand ways but if you know the formula then it is of immense relevance to me today one more example is very interesting that in indian way of examining the student one way of examining the student was called was described as shalaka pariksha that means you will say that i have studied panini or whatever patanjali the book would be brought here i will insert a shalaka in some page 
you will open the book you will read the first line and then tell me what the page contains if you have absorbed the content of the book you will be able to tell me what it contains now this was totally dependent on a chance occurrence this is the element of chance that examination should be based on an element of chance not a predictability nahi to paper phut gaya ये नहीं होना चाहिए आई मीन दिस आई कुड गैदर फ्रॉम दिस शाला का परीक्षा कॉन्सेप्ट दिस इज हाउ परफॉर्मिंग प्रैक्टिस आर ऑलवेज गाइडेड बाय व्हाट पीपल हैव थॉट बिफोर नॉट एवरी टाइम बट देयर नंबर ऑफ टाइम्स दे आर डायरेक्टली कनेक्टेड विद व्हाट वी डू as also continuity and my yeah i remember rightly you were not particularly like the word evolution yes. you said change that's right but in, a, in another context you said that is a development yes now both presuppose change and continuity one is a genus of which another may be species could be i mean one of the ways of development so i want to know how in a musical tradition or otherwise you would say this is evolution this is a development right change is any deviation from the accepted norm definition number 1 right development is fulfillment of the promise which has been made by the earlier change change this is development for me this is sufficient i don't accept evolution as i said what do you like <laughs> firstly because it presupposes that what comes later is better than the <coughs> no sir sir so when i look at development, development means that what is new is definitely better when what is the exact connotation of evolution and as you rightly point out change means giving up of the old i'm using the expression in a loose manner and some change brought in about it and development is accepting of the change or any development of the logical promise made by the earlier change logical promise yes and what is the evolution i we know that you know i mean sare log kiya to baad mein kya aayega so there are definite you know occurrences there you feel oh this would come this would come this may come this may not so there are choices and they are dictated by musical logic sir so evolution means chronological thing evolution as i said no, no. i am only telling you why i don't accept the word evolution <laughs> and why which are the words i use Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I am also thankful to Arjun Bhai Music Forum, NCBA, Vijayabhan, and all of you.